Um, today we're going to look only at chapter four, which is really um, the basics to having a good R workflow. Okay, so it's divided into a couple of sections and it starts off with the very, very basics of R Studio. And most of you are already probably familiar with this, but let's assume if there are any beginners in this group, um, this is how it would work. So we can use R as a calculator and you can see from the slides here, you just run a formula or, or a mathematical formula. You can use it as a calculator. Here's another one, a slightly more complicated one. Oh my goodness, no. Hmm. And so on. You can create new objects. So objects in R are sort of well, quite literally objects that you're trying to manipulate or you're trying to run your operations or your functions on. So you can create a new object with this left facing arrow. So you can create an object called X and then inside that object, you can have three multiplied by four or you can create an object called data. And then in that you have 76 plus 88, the result printed into that. Uh, I think it should be, and later on, if you click just write X into the console or write data into the console, you'll actually find what is in there. So if you put, what is three to four right now? I'm so tired, you guys. Um, three, six, nine, twelve. Um, you will find, if you write X into the console, you will immediately just see 12 printed out for you. Okay. That's really about it for section one. So 4.1, that's coding basics. The next thing that they talk about in the book is how to go about naming your objects. Um, the thing with R is that it is very, very um, sensitive to typos. So it's case sensitive. It's also, yeah, if you use quotation marks or anything of the sort, um, it's going to throw up errors at you if you don't use it right. So what goes into an object name? Object name should always start with a letter. So you can't start anything with a number. Start with a letter and it can contain letters, numbers, underscores. So you have like the underscores you see in your email addresses or usernames and then you have the periods. You also want to of course make sure that your object names are sufficiently descriptive so it makes sense, it, sense to you. So you know what you're looking at. You don't want to have an incredibly long name, but it should be sufficiently descriptive so you know what it is. So, and it also shouldn't be a bunch of numbers. It's like X, Y, Z, one, two, three, four, five, if you don't know. Um, something that's sometimes neglected, but should be discussed when people start out with programming, I guess, are the ways that you can sort of name your objects. So these are like style conventions or naming conventions. And in this case, snake case is what is usually recommended. And here I've printed out the kind of differences, the different types of um, naming conventions. So snake case is where you have the words separated by underscores. It's the neatest possible option that you have. It looks very tidy. You have something called camel case. So it really goes like a camel, like the, the head of the camel goes down, then you have the hump of the camel going down. Um, some people use camel case. Still smart, still looking good, but maybe not as nice as snake case. Uh, you can use periods. So words just separated with periods. This can sometimes get confusing in some situations. And the last one is where it's a total mess, according to me. Um, but basically, where they say a few people renounce all convention, um, it looks chaotic, um, but you never know. If that works for you and you know how it fits together, go for it. So snake case is what is most recommended. And it's nice to start using that right in the beginning rather than have no convention at all. And then you have this jumble of files it's most helpful when you leave your project for a while and then you come back to it later on. Okay, so this is what I said earlier. Oh, how did it get mixed up? Okay, uh, you can inspect an object just by typing its name. So if you press X, you would have seen 12. That's what we did earlier. If you, if you type in data, you see 164, so you just print it. Another thing that they mention, and this is nice for the beginner, the others might already know. Um, you can just use the tab button to have our autocomplete what you're trying to type. 
So uh, this is not important, but for example, you can already have an object in your environment or you can have a couple of variables in your data sets. And if you're typing it out, you can already press tab and then R will usually have like a drop down list where it tries to autofill your data set or your variables. So there was something going on with like, this is a really long name in the book. So if you want to look this up afterwards, uh, we can discuss that. Um, but yeah, the most important lesson is that R can't and won't work with typos. So for example, if you have R underscore rocks, you can't have R underscore rock or say capital R and regular hyphen and rocks. So these are all things that you want to pay attention to. So how do you go around hyphenating or underscoring? How do you have capital letters or not? These are things you want to pay attention to. Okay, the next section is calling functions. So literally, if you have a package in R or even for that matter, R has built-in functions, you want to call them. So you know, bring it to the forefront and use it to run operations on your data or your objects. So there's functions built in, but there's also functions that come with packages. You, again, you can use tab to autocomplete a function that you're trying to type out. So if you're saying filter for uh, the for deployer, 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 um, if you press, if you start typing fil, probably if you press tab, R is going to try and autofill it. You can also bring up a list and you'll see always that there's like a tooltip which kind of reminds you what are the functions, what are the arguments, how it's kind of typed out the code. And of course you can press F1 just to have more information. Um, once you've selected the relevant functions, R will also add opening and closing parentheses. So if you are a complete beginner uh, with us, you can try it out with the sequence function, which is built into R. If you only type S and E, you'll see a list that comes up if you press tab, and, or you can complete or select. And you can complete or select. And the parentheses would have been automatically filled in by R once you select the function, you can fill in the numbers, and then you have a go. Um, parentheses and quotation marks must always come in pairs. And R will usually autocomplete and give you two sets of quotation marks or two sets of like a pair of uh, parentheses, but if it's not the case and you have an error, you can sometimes inspect it and you see how oh, you're missing a quotation mark or you're missing a closing bracket or an opening bracket. Okay, so sometimes you really want to see the results of what you just printed. Uh, normally, you can just type the object name to print the results, so just type X or just type data like we did before, but what you can also do is to have an extra pair of parentheses around the entire line of code. So the normal way would be like this, a print test and you, you, know, you write some data into that object. And then you have another line where you say print test and then it actually gives you what is the result. But the shorter way to do that is that you have that first line of code and then you have a complete set of uh, parentheses where the whole thing is wrapped up there. And then you have, it prints it down. So I've been using our markdown and when I use these code chunks, it seems less relevant because it just automatically prints into the document or if you run your code, the results show right underneath that. But if you were just typing directly um, in and just coding as you go in a regular R workspace, um, this is one way that you can see it straight away. Oh, and they mention at the very end, if you look at an environment, the environment, it shows you all the objects, but this is really something that well, um, most of us already know. Okay. And we are already almost at the end of the workflow chapter. It's not even half an hour, but let's see. There were a couple of questions there just to be sure. So the first question was, why would the second line of code not work? And not because I put the hash there because the code is incorrect and the Zaring and slides wouldn't run it. But maybe someone can just mention it in the chat or just out loud. Um, why would this line of codes not work? It's very easy. Just look at it very carefully.
I don't know. It looks fine to me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> me too. It looks fine. I'm not sure. I mean, between the my and the variable, uh, uh, this the underscore is it connected? Yes, it is. Oh. Okay. Okay. So if no one, it's actually very simple, but in the book also. So maybe you want to pull up the page of the book. I don't know if you have it open. Uh, let me see if I can get you the right page. No, where am I going? Is it 10? The zero, is it zero or is it 10? Ah, okay. I don't know. Okay, uh, it, it does work on my, I don't know why would it not work. It's just uh, assigning a value to a variable name. So Yeah. Yeah, okay. So if you go into 4.4 in Workflow Basics, um, can you see, let me see if I can share. Object, my variable is not found, but you still can't see it? We can't see your screen. I mean, we can see your slide, but not the uh, our studio. Yeah. How, how do I do this? Uh, I think you just go and share that, that screen. If you go to share screen again, and then you will see the multiple, yeah. yeah. Okay, so can everyone see it now? Yeah. Okay. So very, very simple, and it's absolutely not rocket science here, but they have actually filled the eye to be different. Oh, okay. The spelling. It's, it's very, very, very subtle. But just with this one thing, and you can see it here as well, um, my variable is just not found. So quite literally, like you wrote an object with this sort of an eye, and then when you try to run this, it R just literally cannot find it. So at least that's what I figured the answer to the exercise was because they tell you to say, look carefully, this may seem pointless, but it's training your brain to notice even the tiniest difference. So they're really trying to teach us a lesson here. So that's what I went with. But if you can figure out any other reason as to why this error message would pop up, my variable is not found. Uh, no. Yeah, I, I think I think so. Or because it runs on my computer, so if, if you if you run it on your computer, I think it's going to work. And my thought is that uh, in later versions of R of R or R Studio, uh, they R has this functionality that it could um, match fuzzily match variable variable names. No, I don't think it will work if you put the I without a dot. It won't work. Uh, it, it, works it will on my work computer. for me again. Let me try. Here is our studio. Uh, let me check. I think there are different variables. I mean, if you use with uh, uh, I with small letter and I with capital, they are different variables. They cannot be, I mean, R cannot match these two variables, right? To be the same. Yep. That's what I thought as well. I think the whole point is to just be like super careful, like even with the smallest change, it won't yeah. work. Because yeah. I don't know if you can find that kind of eye on your computer. I don't know. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's really weird. Yeah, I it's mean, not Adam, which, yeah? Eye, which eye did you try the second time? Because no. That... So I, 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 I ran it on my computer, on my, my uh, Microsoft. A computer i just copied and pasted I, ah okay i get you what you did is like you just copy the assignment of the variable and run it it will run but no what are saying? i copied what uh niha has put mm -hmm. in her computer right now exactly with a even different the second variable. even the second variable <laughs> yes okay 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 yeah so so here I do, can you all still see my r studio yeah. yeah yeah so you see how i tried to print I put it in. I'm going to clean my environment. Yes, include here an object. So if I put my variable with a regular, the regular way, yes, let me just make a new one. Okay, so I get my variable 10 in the environment and now I'm copying the one with the weird eye, 
which is apparently not on my computer, but I'm just copying it and I'm like, okay, do you see how it gets highlighted, the eye? Mm. Like white, I don't know, wait, can I? Yeah. Wrong button, I was gonna print it up. And when I do that, it says error, my variable not found. So I think it was the eye. Now I'm gonna copy this weird eye one and then print a new object out of it. Yes, just because I copied it, I, it was able, it was working, and then yes, one com, comes back. So I, I guess it's just a lesson in be very careful with typos. Anyways, so I seem to have closed my slides, so let's open the skin. Uh, no! <laughs> Why? Okay. What happened? <gasps> need to open the HTML, not the RMD. Okay, okay. It still works, so that's what's important. Um, the RMD file should have opened, but um, let's continue. Uh, let's see, and I'm going to make sure that I'm just... Screening that one thing. Share screening sharing. It's been a long day, guys. It's just Monday. Okay. So can everyone see the are we back on the exercise page? Everything's fine? Yeah. Cool. Okay. So my answer to one was that it's quite simply just a typo. It seems like an exercise in pointlessness, but there's a lesson in there. All right. So here's an exercise and you can try this out in uh, your R Studio if you have it open. Um, I've put hashtags because there are errors and the document wouldn't render, um, but you can also check the book. So there are errors in the command, uh, in the commands here and what exactly do needs to be tweaked in order for it to run correctly. So people can just offer their opinions. Um, is the spelling, isn't it? Data, um, mm -hmm. data, and in yeah. the in the second one is the filter again. The spelling. Mm -hmm. So maybe you all can also just try it in your um, R Studio because some of the errors that come up is also not visible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think instead of the single equals, it needs to be equal equal as a condition. And anything else? Okay, so I'm just gonna go with this if no one else has anything else. Um, I actually missed one of those and I think it was uh, Hava who mentioned it. Um, I think it worked for me, but I'm not sure. Okay, so some of the answers, one was for me, at least, the ggplot2 package also had to be installed and loaded. Um, there was a typo where Dota had to be data, uh, Blitter had to be filter. Um, if you try to run it, the um, if you try to take inspect the MPG dataset, you'll actually see that diamond and carrots are simply not variables in that dataset. I think diamond, or maybe diamonds, is another dataset like MPG is. Oh. Yeah, it's in the diamond data set, yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> okay, never mind. So I was completely misread that. Um, clearly, I'm new to this, so you can see that. Um, but the double equal sign is also something that I missed, and that's something that I will add to the notes. And I don't think I you need double equal sign. No. No? It's just assignment. No, it's just, it's just assignment. Yeah. This is assignment, so you are not kind of... Ah. Uh, Compare. You are not it's actually not taking a mathematical operation ah, that is okay. when you yeah. are taking if this thing is equal, you know. Because mm -hmm. it did work for me before. So yeah. um, you, you actually need doubles equals because that's how that's a logical function that you want right. to have. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's in the filter function for um, yeah when you are yeah. trying to do operation. Yeah, I just literally just did that a while ago. Oh yeah, and that's why I didn't have that error and put it in there because obviously the code worked. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, diamond is. Uh, it, I think it's di diamonds. 
the data set. Maybe it's just a different data set. Yeah. I, I, it's diamonds. The data set is called diamonds. Ah, uh, yeah. I was trying to find some errors in the actual like operation, uh, and I completely forgot this should be a data set. Well, okay. Well, you fix the data and MPG, you will get your plot. Um, I did double equals, but I still think I got it as I needed it. Yeah, yeah I think because it should be double right equals. One. Yeah, it should be that because this is a logical comparison. No. Okay. So, so when, when you have a condition, um, mm -hmm. you're trying to say equals, you use mm -hmm. double equals. Yeah. But when you're doing um, uh, a kind of mutation, you use single equals because it's assignment of creating a new, a new column. Yeah, for filter, it has to be double equal. Okay. But in the GG plot, that is not a mathematical, of, that's you are just saying yeah. that, you know, yeah. that's single, yeah. it works. Mm -hmm. Okay. So double equal is only in filter and those operations where you're trying to manipulate the data for mm. as part of the deployer. deployer. Okay, it's to basically have a logical operation. You, as a result, you get true or false. You get true if it's equal to A, yeah. and false if it's not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one way to describe it. That makes it way more clear. Okay, well, if that's clear, we are on the last question. If you press Alt Shift K, what happens? Maybe someone wants to press that. Alt Shift K. Um, let's see, let's see. Oh, help. Shortcut T, shortcut tick reference, right? Yeah, so you should get um, shortcuts. Did everyone get shortcuts? No, I, I got Mac, so I don't think it's. Oh, uh, so I think it might be. Okay, control, maybe. Control shift K. Yeah, I, I think it's just asking me to save the file when I. Try option shift K. Option. Oh my goodness, no. So it should be Alt. There is the Alt button in Mac. I also have one. So it's the button next to the command one. So you have CMD next to the space bar and next to that is the Alt, Alt Shift K and I get keyboard shortcuts in Mac. Mm -hmm. um. I mean, is there any way, I mean, this shortcut, keyboard shortcut has way too many. Is there any way one can like find uh, a logical way to remember because like, why do we have alt plus shift? Why do we have command plus this? Why do we have control plus shift? I mean, is there a logical way these I things think, are combined so that I they think, execute a similar function? I think you can change this in our studio. You can give any kind of shortcut for some operation in your our studio. You can uh -huh. change that, but uh, if it doesn't work, then you have to look in your R Studio settings. What is there for different, like for saving different operations, and you know for like uh, giving a shortcut for these assignment operator. So it depends what is already there in the settings, and you can change that. Yeah. Oh, that is nothing like logical way to remember. Okay, uh, if it is to keyboard, okay, it's not control plus shift, it's alt plus shift. There is no logical way to even think in this way. Do you understand my question? Yeah, yeah. I don't think so, there is. If you go to tools, there's yeah. an option to modify keyboard shortcuts okay. and you can add what you think you'll remember better for the things. I see, regularly. I see, okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, with that, we come to the end of the Workflow Basics chapter. Um, it did actually take exactly half an hour, so yay. Um, well, I do have the first part of um, chapter five there, but it might be better to either do it all in one go next week, or I can start now. Alternatively, we can try something else. Does anyone have something in mind for the okay. next half hour?
I think you can do this. So yeah, you can do. You don't have to do everything next week. Mm -hmm. Okay. At least then we can do some exercises if this. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So shall I just continue? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. So here's where things get a bit more serious, and that's in chapter five for data transformation. Okay. So. The previous chapter where Cameron did a fantastic presentation and completely raised expectations a little too much for the rest of us. Um, but we did a GD plot and that was visualization. And obviously for visualization, it's, it's a very important tool. But before we even get to that point, we might need to manipulate the data in ways that are useful for us. Um, and that's what this chapter is going to be all about. So Really nice if you have RStudio with you and you can kind of go along with this and have the book also there if you want to copy some slide, um, some code directly. Um, the prerequisites for this is that we use the NYC Flights 13 uh, data set. Um, so you can just, I think it's already in our built in, so you can just use the library function and also load in uh, Tidyverse and ggplot2. The NYC Flights data set basically has flight data that departed um, from basically from New York City in 2013. So all the flights that departed New York City in 2013. And you can also look up the documentation if you just do a question mark flight. Um, you can inspect the table. So I didn't do it in the slide because it would go all over the place. Um, but you can inspect the table by entering flights into the console or you can run view flights to see the whole data set. So this is a very nice slide, the most straightforward slide that you can get. When we work with Deployer, I'm just going to call it Deployer. Um, if anyone else wants to correct me, let's go with it. Um, but Deployer right. is what we use to, um, yeah, with most data manipulation tasks. And there's five of them. So there's five key functions, or you call them verbs. Um, and there's also an additional function which we'll come to. So the five verbs that we use are filter. So to really pick observations by their values. So you select, you know, I want this value, X 10 and I want 13. And then you filter to pick up only those observations. You have a range, which is to reorder rows. So not columns, but, to, but rows specifically. You can use select to pick variables by their name. So if you really want uh, to pick out select variables, you can use well specific variables by their name to use the select function. And eventually you can also highlight the difference between filter and select later. Um, mutate, which is to just create new variables with functions of existing ones. So you're really just using the existing variables to create a new one. So say one row multiplied by the other one, for example. Um, and summarize to collapse many values down to a single summary. That might also be useful. Um, and last but not least, these verbs you can apply, if you were to apply it just by itself, it would go for the entire data set. So it would operate on the entire data set. Sometimes you don't need the whole data set. You only want to work with a few variables. And for that, you can use the group by function. So you change the scope of your function. So you go at just on those specific columns or just on those specific variables. So this was very nice for me because it's sometimes a bit like, oh, there's so many things going on in the tidyverse. It's, it's kind of like, I can't um, bring it all together to make an overview, but just for the basics, when you say, oh, there's only five specific verbs, um, that makes it much more um, manageable or friendly. So, yeah, so I have a question. So the tidyverse, Include many stuff in ggplot and also the flyer, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if I, uh, okay, if I load tidyverse, I don't need to load the, the flyer, right? No. But ggplot, you do have to load. ggplot is something that. Tidyverse? It is part of the Tidyverse. So if you go to the Tidyverse website. Yeah, I can see, you can see, yeah. Oh wait, can you see my screen? Yeah, oh, okay. Can you see my screen yeah. or the HTML slides? Yes, screen, your screen. 
Oh, okay, I have no idea. Okay, so if you're on the Tidyverse website, you'll see that uh, ggplot2 is a, within the Tidyverse universe, so to speak, um, and also deployer and radar, everything. But when you load in Tidyverse, um, yeah, deployer it seems to come with it. But ggplot, for some reason, we have to do it separately. And I think it was because it was developed separately, and now they just kind of oh. were decided to make it under the, put it under the family. I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't think you do. I, yeah. I typically load ggplot separately. Really? Yeah. So the, only, the, the, only time, the only time you might need to load ggplot separately is sometimes they take long. They have updates in ggplot alone, but they haven't um, shipped them to tidyverse. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I've had some errors where I haven't been able to run ggplot even though tidyverse was in there. Uh -huh. But then later when I really specify library ggplot2, it works. So I don't know what's going on in my R studio. See, this is why we need book club with multiple people. So we know that all these scenarios are possible. So in this case, um, uh, ggplot is the grammar of graphics. Mm -hmm. Gplyr is the grammar of data manipulation in that case. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know if they actually even call it that, but uh, pretty much. Uh, yeah, it's literally, yes, grammar of data manipulation. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Uh, where are my slides? No, go away. Okay. All right. Um, if there's no questions, I'll just move on to this slide. Um, so basically, um, these verbs or these functions, they work very similarly. So it's, more, it's very predictable when you want to try and read that line. Uh, the first argument is always a data frame. So you have filter, which is the function. Um, this is your data frame. So that's the first argument. And the remaining arguments describe what you want to do with the data frame. So you can have months um, and where well, the month equals one and the day equals one. So in this case, you want to see all the flights that departed on 1st of January first day of the first month of the year. So that's first of January. And you get, you get a new data frame. And of course, if you want to save the results, you will have to use the assignment operator. So once again, the same code, you can write it to an object called January one or Jan one. Um, and at the same time, if you want it printed out uh, immediately and you're not using R Markdown, you can enclose it in a second pair of parentheses. So it's written to into an object and it also prints out to you straight away. So that's the most basic way of writing this. Now I'm just pressing, yeah, okay. So that's about it for the very basics of Deployer. And then we move into the next subsection, which is how to you know, ex start using Deployer to its full. Can you go back uh, to the previous slide, please? Yeah. yeah. I'm wondering like, um, so in R, like in other programming language, we just use equal sign to make assignments. So also I read is it in this chapter that uh, in R, we can also use the equal sign to make assignment, right? So what, why? In our community, we are not using the natural way to do assignment. We are using this um, arrow. I don't know. Can anybody answer that? So why they use the arrow instead? Yes. Uh, why 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 does R use this assignment operator? You mean instead yeah. of regular equal to sign? Yeah. Because to this in this chapter, I read it like you can use the equal sign, but they said like you may have some trouble or some problem along the way. Yeah, I mean, you can get confused because, you know, you are using equal sign everywhere then. And that will, this is just kind of distinctive that you are assigning a value to this variable name. So this is just like one of those, um, you know, you have to stick to because the R community or its recommended usage. So you can use equal sign, but it's, it, it will get confusing. But it also it will also work, right? It will work, yeah. Okay. But, uh, yeah. 
Yes. You know? uh, so I, 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 also, I also think that uh, the, the difference, the, the main purpose for me is for inter interpretation or in, in, intuition. So for example, you could write um, X, then you put the, that, uh, that sign, 10. Then you can also write it the other way around and say 10, uh, for, yeah. I don't know how to call it. You assign it again, but use um, a greater than sign, X. Mm -hmm. But you can't do it with the equal sign. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I think if you use the shortcut, like on my Mac, is is option and a minus, you know, minus sign. So you don't have, I don't know how you're using it now on your computer. You use like a list and sign and then minus. If that is difficult for you, on my laptop, the shortcut is option minus key. So it's easy to do it that way. You can yeah, try option you like minus, that. right? Sorry? Option minus, it gives you the shortcut. Yeah, on my, uh, it works on my laptop. I'm not sure what's on your laptop, the settings. Yeah, also on Mac, if you press the shift, um, alt minus, right? It gives you the shortcut, that shortcut. Okay. Yeah, alt minus. Okay, cool. Neha, you can continue. Sorry. Okay. So the next part is um, comparisons. So when you want to start filtering more effectively and in more detail, or you have multiple ways you want to filter, you want to start using comparison operators. And R has plenty of, uh, plenty of standard ones. So the greater than, the greater than plus equal to, less than, less than plus equal to, not equal to is you have an exclamation point and one equal sign. And when you have equal to, you have the double equal signs. And they make it very clear in the book that one of the easiest mistakes you can make in, at least with using filter, um, is that you use a regular equal to sign instead of a double equal to equals to when testing for equality. Uh, you do get an error, a very clear one when it um, occurs. So say like, should you be using the double equal to sign? So hopefully if that ever occurs, you know it's just that. Okay. Um, even beyond that, so you can, this will be one way to filter it effectively. So that's just one, la one layer say of filtering but then you might be in a situation where you want to use multiple arguments within a filter. How does the filter function work? It goes row by row. So you specify a certain type of operation and then it will go row by row to check whether what you specified is true or not. So I want something with that is equal to the value of 11. So it, deployer is going to go row by row and it's going to check is it 10? Then it's a false. Is it 9? It's false. Is it 11? Uh, true. Is it 12? False. 11? True. So that's how um, it works. Um, so effectively, you, what you need to do is you need to write out your formula there to, be, to ensure that every time the expression will be true in order for it to be included in the output. And the options for expanding your Boolean operators are and so this and sign for literally and um, this one for or and the exclamation mark for not. So these are the three additional operators you can use to expand and combine the six that are mentioned in this slide. And the book has a very helpful uh, figure that you can always take a peek at when you feel like, okay, what exactly does it mean? So the shaded region shows which part the operator actually selects. So, okay, the brightness on my computer is a bit weird, so I can't see, yeah, okay. Uh, so for example, if you have X and you have Y, uh, you tell it only to select Y and not X, you can see that only the shaded part of Y has been selected. If you want X and Y, so 
the part where there's an overlapping and an inclusion of both X and Y has been shaded here. The others have been left out. So only X and only Y has been left out. This is the other way around. Here you have selected everything that's X. Here you've selected everything that's Y. This is a bit unusual. Um, I haven't uh, figured this one out. So basically, oh, I understood. You want to choose everything that's X, everything that's Y, but you want to leave out where there's an overlap of both. So X plus Y, you want to leave those out. And the last one here is X and Y, X or Y. So you can have all of it all together. Um, does this make sense? And shall I continue? All right. So here is some example code of all the flights that departed in November or December. So you filter, you have your flights, um, you have months where it's equal to 11, or you have month which equals to, a double equals to 12. And I can't print the whole table here, but something you can try out um, in our studio right away. Um, there is something here that it would be nice to discuss a bit more to make it more clear. I figured this out in general, but maybe if someone can explain it differently, it will kind of process better. Um, so basically the operations don't work like in English. And like I mentioned, it, each row is checked whether month equals 11 or 12 and evaluates it, it as true. So you can't write the code below because then only flights from January pops up and they tell you why. Uh, because if it's false, it the operator says it like it's true. Again, we have to look this up. If you can read the book uh, page there. So when we type this slide, uh, this code, technically what you're trying to say is or it's 11 or 12, but you only included month once. So month equals 11 or 12. But what happens is that you see here in the month column, it's one 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 one, and whereas over here. Oh boy, where did it go? Yeah, you specified month equals 11 or month equals 12. And then you have all the 11s here and 12 comes below. Uh, if we go into the book, wait, why can't I move this? Uh, let's see, data transformation. You're all seeing my book, right? So you're seeing the book online? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to logical operators. Yeah. So he here they says, so the order of operation doesn't work like in English. You can't use this code, which you personally might translate it. Oh, find all the flights that departed in November, or December. Instead, it finds all the months that equal 11 by 12, an expression that evaluates to true. And then he in a numeric context, like here, true becomes one. So this finds all flights in January, not November or December. It's very confusing. I, I like how they wrote that because this is like, why? So if someone else can explain this in a more clear way, um, it would, I think, add to what we're trying to discuss. Um, on the other hand, if no one can explain it better, um, you just know that you need to put month equals 11, month equals 12, and not have just one time the argument. And just keep that in mind and just go with it. Just accept it as the truth. It's basically like, as it was sort of explaining there, any true like value such as 11 or 12 or a non-empty string these are what's called truthy values so they there is some like something is present it's it's non-zero values these yeah. sort of evaluate to true and if you you can try it on RStudio if you try to write it as a numeric value you will get one so mm -hmm. whereas if you basically had um month equals equals and in your brackets you had zero or zero that would evaluate to false which would give you zero so it's basically like the equivalence between true and one and yeah. false and zero that's tripping up here yeah yeah i figured it was just this evaluation of whether it's true or false 
but to sort of verbalize that I was struggling a bit. Uh, well, thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Um, Wait, you want to say something? Yeah. So, can I go back to the, to the book? Oh, the book. So, I'm thinking it in this, I mean, the intuition in this way, like, uh, can you come down? Can you come? Yeah, okay. So, uh, where we have light, okay, we have month equals equal to 11, then O, 12. So, I mean, uh, this, in the, op I mean, the order of operations is logical operation where we have 11, 12, and, uh, okay, the way I'm thinking it, it doesn't work. <laughs> Let go on, go on. Yeah, it's, it's very, it's difficult to, to explain. Like, I feel like I also have it in my head, but like, yeah. Well, as long as we all get like it on our own level, then. because like okay, the order of operation I think because we have comparison operator here, and we have a logical operator here, and the logical operator here between eleven and twelve has higher precedence than the comparison operator. Mm. So in this case, eleven and twelve will be evaluated first. That is eleven o twelve, which is logical operator which yeah. I mean, it doesn't give any sense, I guess, then it will be, comp the comparison operator will be evaluated. So it doesn't make sense, I guess, this way as well, where, what I was thinking before. Just go. Yeah. Well, I'm going to think, go on here. Uh, but thanks everybody for trying to make sense of it all together. Uh, this okay so but um they did try to yeah. make this a bit easier so. okay right yeah oh yeah sorry sorry go ahead that was a mistake wait what happened i i posted something in the chat but uh it was my mistake ah, no problem okay um so you we're still on this topic basically so they were trying to explain to us why this 11 ah. or 12 doesn't work and they say and a useful way okay. to explain this for yourself is Alan, having, yeah. for example, uh, if you so want... I want to start, Neha. Yeah. So what Alan posted here, these operations, because as I was saying, I mean, the order of operation, the precedence matters. So if we see this 11 and 0, 12, it gives us true. So in this case, where we have the... Uh, okay, can you go back to the previous slide? Yeah, yeah, okay. So in this case, we have equal, equal, two, equal, equal, mm -hmm. and we have O operation. So the O, 11, O, 12, will evaluate it to two. Yeah, yeah. And the order of precedence will always, the O superseded equal, equal. So this will be evaluated first, then the comparison will be done. Mm. I think I guess maybe the comparison operator has higher precedent than the logical O, then this should statement will be valid. I'm not sure whether this is true, Alan. Yep. Yes. Yes. Oh, thank you for this chat one. Oh, okay. Um, wait. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. So here they try to just make it more straightforward and just basically how we discussed it. So you can filter flights and then they really specify the months within the columns and then you want to see either 11 or 12. It's just a shorthand, but basically of course, tidy words are supposed to make things simpler. So use the other type, but this would work as well. Um, yeah, this is also more extra logic stuff, which I felt I was, you know, I was happier without it because I could just follow the rules. Um, but yeah, you can simplify this complicated subsetting by remembering um, the Morgan's law. So not X and Y is the same as not X or not Y. And not X and Y is also the same as not X and not Y. So the difference here is you have this or, 
and thing and this is also like you have the bracket so here you have the exclamation mark and the brackets or or and alternatively you also have not x and not y so if you wanted to find oh sorry so if you wanted to find flights that weren't delayed on arrival or departure by more than two hours you can use either of the two filters and both would basically work um, so you can try flights and then basically here they say it is not so basically those without an arrival delay of greater than 120 minutes and or without a departure delay of greater than 120 minutes here also it is you can have flights and then you want uh, flights with an arrival delay of less than or equal to 120 minutes and a departure delay of less than or equal to 120 minutes. The difference here being here you have the exclamation mark and then you have or and here instead you operate it differently. If someone wants to re-explain this more, more in detail, the floor is yours. And the last note is don't use the double and and the double or. Um, it's not just a matter of it being a typo, but it actually comes up later in another chapter when we're trying to make like functions of our own. Okay. If this is clear, I'll move on, but we can also come back to this um, because we're almost done. And then we can come back. Okay. So missing values. Uh, this is the last part of this uh, sub chapter or the subsection on filter. Uh, missing values are basically unknown values and they are contagious in the sense that if you have an operation involving an unknown, the answer will by default come back as an unknown. So if you have, oh, you know, what is greater, NA or, yeah, is NA greater than five? The answer is NA. If it's NA plus 10, they'll just give you back NA. NA divided by two, it's NA. So the NA basically always, to use the word term something just used, like it always takes precedence and it's contagious and that, you know, that's where the operation will just go to. If you want to determine if a value is missing, use this code, so is.na, and this could be the, the data set. It could also be a column. Um, so is dot na x and you'll basically get either it's true or false. So if nothing is missing, you'll get false. If something is missing, you'll get true. Um, remember that filter only includes rows where the condition is true. It excludes both false and na values. So if you want to preserve them, you have to state it explicitly. So in this case, if you say uh, you have a data frame and the tibble, and then you just have three values, one, NA, and three. Um, and then you try to filter anything that's, you know, greater than one, you'll get, yeah. Oh, sorry. I'm, yeah, you'll get three. Uh, but you don't see NA. But I'm not sure if I'm even reading this right. Yeah, Any more. Right? Mm -hmm. Greater than one. It's only three that is greater, so NA will not be shown. Mm -hmm. Only the three. Okay, greater than one, right? Um, yeah, and then you have again uh, filter. Now, yeah, what is the meaning of is NA? What is is NA? I mean, what is the meaning of is NA? I don't know if there's a specific meaning to it. I think it's just. Uh, does anyone else have an answer? Because um. They so, just check so just, and NA. Just, just, just to take it literally, um, it, it is just um, a, a so sort of like a logical uh, function trying to find out whether a, a certain value is not known, or in this case, NA. Yeah. So quite literally, is, is there an NA? You can try and look at it that way. Yeah, and there is different other ones where, for example, is dot numeric, uh, like like the like like the one have has written in uh, in in the chat, or is dot integer, 
you might also think about it like that. Okay. Yep. Um, in the next line of code, you can see it's pretty much the same thing, except that in between you have is NA X and then or. And in this case, you can see that NA has been uh, printed out as well. So, okay. So, the NA means only not available, right? NA, the NA part means not available. So, okay, it's NA, it's not available. Okay, cool. Yep, I think it is um, also, yeah, I think it's just not available. Um, yeah, not available. Yeah. It's not available. Of values that are not available. Yeah, it returns the value that are not available. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, and that's it for this chapter. But there are some exercises that we could either get started with, but we're exactly at the one hour mark. So these are the exercises. Find all the flights. Um, then there are, se there are seven subsets. There's two, there's three, and there's four. So we could take a crack at it, or we can also just wrap up for today, discuss how it went, and think about next week. How's everyone feeling? Yeah, next week we can go at it. Mm -hmm. We can do some reading and drill at home, and then next week yeah. um, we can look at the 